Okay. Thanks a lot. So um, it meant a lot for me to um, come to be able to come to this conference, and I had underestimated the difficulties of modern travel. Um, you imagine traveling without snow, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a place with doesn't have snow or shun, sunshine, and uh, it's harder to get out of there than I thought. But I'm happy to be here, which is close to home, and I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've done. I use Stan a lot, but I'm not going to talk to all these power Stan users about Stan, although it'll come up a little bit. But the philosophy behind several things in Stan have a, have a lot to do with geometry. And the modern problems that we have um, in the kind of applications I do have a lot to do with heterogeneous objects where the only way around um, doing statistics is finding distances and using distances. So I'm going to talk about uncertainties and um, distances. So I work in biology and um, in particular in the immune system and the study of the microbiome and uh, cancer. And we'll look at various places where we're trying to do data integration and statistics, but for these complicated objects. And this is a typical example um, that I'll talk about. This is a lymph node with cancer and various um, networks that go with it. So the challenges are, as you know, the data are never uniformly distributed on any manifold. You might have a manifold, but there's not uniform distribution. So the data on IID, in any way, so you can't use standard statistics. They're not dependent, independent, and we have a lot of what we call heteroscedasticity. So that's a long word for saying that the variances are different in different places of the state space. So the way I think about data is geometric, and so you have points which are observations, and they're in some sort of space. So here I've put them in a space with just their variables as they're measured as if they were in what we call a Euclidean space with coordinates which can have um, orthogonality. Uh, we actually generalize that, but that's the, the basic idea. So these dots represent your subjects, which are often represented as matrices. And the distances that we use, some of them are given to us very naturally. You have spatial distances if you're studying different geographic points. Um, but we also have weighted uh, Euclidean distances like Mahanobis that I'll talk about that come up in image analysis. Contingency tables, when you're analyzing discrete data, we often use the chi-square distance. And in ecology, I studied the human microbiome. We like the jacquard distance, which is a sort of distance which gives much more importance to things which are present. Um, the earth mo mover's distance is uh, a Wasserstein uh, distance, also works, um, and very useful for distances on trees and graphs. So you see we have a whole array of possible distances. And we could ask, you know, what do we use distances for? And a lot of people use them for clustering. That's one of the main, or finding nearest neighbors. But we can also make network edges for points which are uh, close together with regards to a certain distance. And you can also use them for making correlations in high dimensions. And I'm going to sh So this is a cell segmentation problem where we were trying to de detect uh, different cell types. And the red cells here are stained cancer cells. And the blue cells are healthy cells. And we also have various kinds of immune cells in the same image. So this is multispectral imaging. And one of the problems is the staining is extremely heterogeneous. So from one slide to the other, you don't have at all the same depth of color in red for the cancer cells and depth of blue for the ordinary nuclear. So you have to do something which is much more adaptive. So if you imagine these two um, clusters of points in some sense, and they're in an eight-dimensional hyperspectral space, so we have eight wave wavelength in the images, and we, we want to decide what, you know, what are the different cell types. And you can see that very clearly you have two separate clusters. In reality, the data aren't quite like that, but you, know, you have a point which is sort of in the middle and you want to decide which cluster it belongs to. Here's a more realistic one. So we have this point here. And you want to decide whether it's uh, this type um, of cell or that type. 
And if you look at the ordinary Euclidean distance, you might be tempted to say, OK, well, it's close to here, so I'm going to assign it to this group. And this is sort of what people do when they just look at the data without taking into account the densities. So you have the probabilities, and if you don't take them into account, you're going to get the wrong answer. So in fact, the closest, the cluster to which this should be assigned is um, this cluster. And the reason for that is the scaling is different. And we have, you know, this is actually called in statistics, it's called the Mahalanobis distance. But the idea here is we're going to incorporate the density into the distance. And so here, this um, cloud has much higher standard deviation. So in fact, this point has a higher probability of belonging to that cluster. So we make this weaving of probability and distance together. So the distance can incorporate the density, and we can do that in order to have a distance which knows at the same time what the, how uh, uh, frequent some classes are. And this is when I said at the beginning of the talk, there's real, there are real problems with trying to um, use the uniform distribution, for instance, or just the plain Euclidean distance. This is the, what I was thinking of. So incorporating this distance, of course, when you run Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, for instance, this is a very natural thing that occurs, that it's across the space. We have a difference in the probability. Things get sticky at certain points. So one of the choices that people make when they're taking the data is, well, we can sphere the data, and we can make a transformation. So we can rescale the data so that they are um, both of the clusters are circular, and so this is what you get here. And in a paper I wrote with um, Percy Diakonis and Meridad Sheshahani, we did more complicated transformations of measure. So if you're trying to, say, generate points at random on a torus, um, you can take into account, you have to take into account the geometry of the torus and make a change of variables, but you can still do it. And so the geometry and the, the probability densities, in some sense, are dual of each other. And I want to talk to you more about that duality. The results of what we did when we used this Mahalanobis were quite striking. We were able to recognize, so here we did two examples. One is finding oranges in an orange grove. And um, these are the red points. And unfortunately, with the lighting, I'm not persuaded that you're going to see all of this. But the, the light yellow points are the oranges, and then the red points are the points that we found. And here, the same thing for the cancer cells. We were able to find the center of all the cancer cells. And then this enabled us to do something like spatial statistics on the lymph nodes and on the tumors and find you know, high-density areas, which was what was really important to us. You have certain types of cell that occur um, close to the tumor cells. So uh, let me summarize what I just said. We can add, I started off by saying the points uh, for me were points in a geometrical space. And we can add information. And here I've tried to add the information, in some sense, the uncertainty about the points uh, by adding weights. Um, in this geometry. The variables themselves, and this is the other side to things, variables are vectors in the space of points. So on the one hand, you have n points in p space and p points in n space. Those are the dual of each other. And depending on whether you have a large number of um, variables or a large number of points, you're going to benefit computationally from choosing which um, space you work in. So nowadays, we very often have um, tens of thousands of variables measured on not so many, uh, maybe the hundreds of subjects. So you're much better off working in um, the space, in some sense, in this space where you have only um, the variables are in a low dimensional space. But you have this transposition or duality which is possible. And um, so that is done through inner products, is the simplest way of thinking of it. In the more general case, we use kernels for doing that. But 
you can rescale um, on the one hand to make everything have the same variance by having a diagonal matrix. Um, but you can also use a, a matrix like the Marlinovis matrix to rescale uh, all the levels and not only with a diagonal matrix so that you make everything which is sphered. But thinking about that as weights that you put on the points are uh, pretty useful. So this um, is the inner products that we use, one which is weighting the points the n different subjects or the individuals, and q is the weighting of the variables. And as I said, you usually only have to, if you're doing, for instance, a PCA, you only have to diagonalize one of those. And uh, so the dimension reduction, the, the, the standard workhorse for a lot of what we do is a generalization of ordinary PCA where you actually allow yourself um, these extra weights. So it's a weighted singular value decomposition which gives you the solution. Now, I want to generalize this because later on what happens, and let me tell you a little bit about where we're going so you know why I'm doing this. Um, Imagine that you were in a situation where you wanted to do a Bayesian analysis of PCA, so you have posterior distributions of many, many PCAs. And the, there is a difficulty which occurs, which is that all the different PCAs don't lie in the same space. So you need a way in which you can compare the output of each of the PCAs and align them. And the way to do that is that you can actually generalize the ordinary correlation coefficient from uh, doing correlations to, between vectors to doing correlations between matrices. And this is just by taking the trace of the inner product of the matrices and whatever the matrix which is associated with your analysis, and this is called the RV coefficient. And this gives an inner product between two matrices. Now, this was done in the 70s, and it's turned out to be very useful for doing sort of what I call linear registration. Um, it actually is a generalization of a very old method. Um, Henry Daniels has a, had a method, um, it's now called the Mantell method, where if you have two distances, say it's distances between, um, you know, how people spend their uh, leisure and distances, geographic distances. And you could ask, are those two distances, if you look at different locations, San Francisco and Boston and so on, can you, look, can you make a correlation between those two distances? So correlation between two distance matrices is very much like correlation between ordinary um, data. And this was done by saying, um, I'll vectorize, in some sense, the distance matrix. Um, and so I take the two. Um, and the only thing important is the way you vectorize, that is, the, the way you make the matrix into a vector has to be the same in both cases. And then you can do just an ordinary correlation coefficient, and you can do a permutation test and find out whether your distances are correlated. And this gives the same um, uh, object, you know, the trace of the inner product is the same. I'm going to leave out that, and I'm going to take a, a generalization of multidimensional scaling now and show you how we can use it in a sort of more nonlinear way. So if you start off with a distance matrix instead of starting off with ordinary coordinates, which is often something that occurs, then you, you can use something very akin to PCA. It's called multidimensional scaling. It's an old... A method which was originally mathematically defined by Schoenberg in the 1930s. And it allows you to go from a distance matrix to some coordinates in a Euclidean space so that you can make a representation of the points in a low dimensional space and still have an idea of what they would look like. So the, 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 some of the basic examples that you'll see in textbooks are you're given the distances between the cities in Europe and you want to make a, ba a map of Europe. Uh, what comes out is sometimes that the north and the south of Europe are inverted and the east and the west are inverted, but basically it'll give you back a pretty good map. Uh, uh. So this is done also using... Um, singular value decomposition. So it's a very uh, fast algorithm. It works very well um, to do multidimensional scaling. I'm going to show you an example. This is data. Um, the, it, 
was most popular, it started being very popular in the 60s. And this is an example that was developed um, originally by Ekman for finding out how people perceive color. So it's a color confusion data. And he, here, high values mean um, I'm confusing these two wavelengths of color the most. So in some sense, that's the similarity of the two colors. In order to actually look at the multidimensional scaling, I have to look at one minus that. And so um, in the confusion, you know, 86% of the time, um, people are confusing these two wavelengths. That means that they're actually quite close. So I'll put one minus that value, the distance. And if I make the multidimensional scaling, the classical one of this, um, you get something like this. And um, so here, this is an arch. And this is because, in fact, there's an underlying gradient in the colors. Now, this has been unfortunate because um, this gradient was developed and defined in the 1970s by Kendall for archaeology and for timing uh, different artifacts, archaeological artifacts. And he called this the horseshoe effect. And it doesn't have anything to do with the horseshoe prior. So now we're trying to call it the arch effect to get away from the confusion. But this is the horseshoe that you get if you have underlying here, there's just one dimension. It's the wavelength in some sense. But this one dimension is sitting in two dimensions. Um, but we have a one dimensional gradient. So in some sense, we have a way of ordering data which ha lie in a very high dimension along a line, and so you could call this manifold learning in one dimension. And um, so this is the color confusion, and this is the results that you get for that. Um, I took, I wrote a paper with um, Percy and um, Sherrod Goel, and we took data from um, the House of Representatives from 2005, and we looked at how people were voting, minus one, plus one, um, for yes and no, and then abstentions were zero. And then we looked at the data using the same multidimensional scaling. We made a small change. We looked at kernel, a kernelized version of it so that you don't put too much of the sort of energy into points which are far apart. But if you look at the naive one, you look at just how often they vote differently, and that makes the distance become different. So if we did a 3D mapping of the House of Representatives, you get something like this. And in fact, what you're seeing, but I can't rotate here, but you have two horseshoes. So you have two clusters. And if you look at their parties, which were not put into the program, but of course they vote differently, completely. But what's most interesting about this is they're on two completely different scales. That is, the Democrats. Um, have one scale from left to right, the most left-wing Democrats, the most right-wing ones. And you also have the same for the most left-wing um, uh, Republicans and the most right-wing. But they have their own gradients. So there are two gradients here, two horseshoes, um, but they're orthogonal to each other. And that is, that's a sort of a, a, a general method which you can verify. What we wanted to do and where we use STAN uh, was we actually very interested in um, trying to find these underlying gradients in all kinds of biological data. So there's something called single cell data, which are measurements of data as the embryo or as the cells develop. Um, and so then you want to time. You don't know the time in the development, but you can reconstruct time. So, you know, like in Proust, finding time. It's Finding the pseudo time, um, which you want to reconstruct from very, very high dimensional data. And this works very well. That is, you can find um, uh, the underlying gradient uh, quite easily. But we wanted to quantify the uncertainty. That is, we wanted to find out whether there were places where, um, in some sense, this gradient was more fuzzy than others, um, which would merit in some sense, collecting more data. Um, this was also true when we were looking at data. Um, we look at the bacteria in the ocean and collect samples going down at different depths. So even if you don't tell the program um, that the data were collected at different depths, that depth variable will come out as a natural gradient. So very often, people show me data 
and they say, well, it doesn't cluster very well, as if when you have distances, the only method um, is to make clusters. But in fact, if you have an underlying gradient or a, a spectrum of something which is varying, like the pH, the temperature, or something like that, you won't see clusters. You'll see this horseshoe always occur. And it might occur in high dimensions, so it's harder to see if you project it. It's also one of the uh, f underlying phenomena or the latent continuous variables, which are very well um, pinpointed by uh, the method of um, Hinton called TSNE. And so this is exactly the same sort of method, except in TSNE, um, they allow themselves to vary the estimator of the variance um, along the points. But in this paper, which has now appeared in BMC Bioinformatics, we used STAN to try to get an uncertainty on the rankings um, that come out and so the, of the different points. And we used a Bayesian model for the distances. And so here, the idea is the only distance I care about, in some sense, is the distance along the one-dimensional manifold. That's the delta. And then the distance that I observe in the high dimensional space is the dij. And so you can model these, and we use a gamma. And so this true difference, uh, the tau i and tau j, are the points, the coordinate points on the actual manifold. And then we have various um, you know, hyperpriors for the parameters, but th this is um, the first part of the model. The second part is different, point, different parts of space have different density of points. And that means that you're estimating the distances with very different variances, depending on whether you have an area of space which is quite sparse, in data points, or an area of space which is um, uh, in which you have an enormous number of points, so it's very, very dense. So you have what we call heteroscedasticity, especially in those kinds of situations, and so the variance needs to be uh, variable. So we also uh, model the variance um, as part of the model, and we allow it to change. So we have a scale parameter. And the idea there is to use the same thing as I showed you for Mahalanobis, that is, it's extremely important to rescale your data in order to be able to get um, a good idea of the, what the, how the data is going to come out um, for the rankings. So the first thing that we were trying to do is get an idea of the uncertainty of the projection of the points. So the, the points here as you see them along their line, this is where they were projected. The data points are these gray points, and these are the, the toe I hat, in some sense. The points are there projected. And here, this is what we wanted. These are contours of the uncertainty with which we know where each of the points project. So it's a bit of a mess if we put all the points, but this gives you an idea, and you can see that the shape of the contours, there's no, we're not making any hypothesis about normality, none of these data anyway. Most of the data are counts, so then underlying um, process isn't normal or multivariate normal. So the contours are given by the Bayesian posterior, um, which is computed with Stan according to this model. And then what we were interested in, of course, is the ranking and the places where the ranks are well known. And so here, this is the data that I was talking about on the oceans, where they're at different depths. And you can see that the, the jump, there's less uncertainty in some sense in the rankings here. Then there's a big jump as to what happened um, at high depth and low depth. And the confidence intervals that you see are confidence um, posterior predictive intervals for the rankings. And so you can see that they're not, it's not uniform, um, and the confidence intervals are not all of the same size. And that allows us to go back and say, well, we need more samples of this depth because we need more resolution. Um, but it did use that um, exact uh, model um, that I showed you with the, with the Bayesian unidimensional um, scaling, and this is how we did it. I use R, so everything in my lab is reproducible and we always 
publish all our code. So the code's available on GitHub, and uh, we use Stan for doing this particular one. Uh, uh, and so I just showed you an example of how to um, do an analysis of the microbiome data. I sort of have done things not in the right order because I should have told you a little bit of what the microbiome are. And so the, the data themselves are DNA, which are taken from one particular gene, uh, which is a gene which is the same in all um, the bacteria, but has a few regions which are variable, which serve as the fingerprint, which tells us which species are present. Now, in, in seawater, it's, it's tens of thousands of different bacteria. Um, and in humans, you have more bacterial cells than you have of your own cells. So the bacteria are very important. And people think bacteria are bad, but 99% of them are actually um, health, either neutral or keeping you healthy. They're only a very small proportion which are bad. And we have all of this data, and we have these problems of trying to combine them. Um, and uh, you have different data in uh, different microbial um, distributions um, in different parts of your body. And one of the challenges is every new data set, we don't have a fixed set of bacteria. So it's like an infinite alleles model in some sense where you have infinitely many categories and you're only looking at a subset of it. Now, we... We had this problem. I'm not going to give you too many um, of the details. Um, this is a paper that appeared in JAZA um, last year. And it's work that I did to try and make um, posterior distributions of the multidimensional scaling type plots that I just showed you. But we didn't necessarily know um, that there was a gradient or not. We just were trying to see um, how much the fact that in the different samples, you have different depth. So it's as if when you're trying to do the sampling, you spend more time. So if you go out and you collect data about you know, different birds that are along the beach here, it's very different if you go out and count the birds for an hour or if you go out and count them for 12 hours. You're going to get a different sample size. So you might see in the 12 hours some quite rare ones whereas you wouldn't see them if you only spent an hour out. So that's one of the big challenges of this data. That is, so here we have a table, which is a contingency table. And we have what we call OTUs. They're actually the taxa. They're the different species. And then you have these different types of bacteria, which are there. So what we want to do is we want to take into account um, the different frequencies and the overall um, number of cases in each of the sample. So we make a model, um, and we're going to make a Bayesian non-parametric model of this. And one of the characteristics of all these data sets is that there's an underlying low-dimensional number of factors which can explain it. So we have, um, for one data set, for instance, the one I just showed you, you would have the different species and then the different, um, in the different samples. I call them different populations, but they're the different samples that you took. But if you're doing a Bayesian posterior, you're going to pick, you're going to have a whole cube of data, many, many, many picks from this um, model that you got. And the challenge is the challenge of trying to see where, what space, or where can I compare in a multivariate way uh, what's going on with the Bayesian posterior? And so that's what we were interested in. Now, we used a gram um, operator. We used a kernel method in order to compare the different populations. Um, we, we don't know ahead of time, so there was a little bit of mathematics um, uh, which were a bit complicated because it's, uh, we, never, we don't have a finite multinomial to start with. And the other difficulty is if you fix the multinomial, um, then you have the independent draws. Now, the taxa don't work like that. That is, some of the species can only thrive if there's these three other species in the, in the, in the environment. To get, they work together. So they work in symbiosis, so the multinomial just doesn't work for that. Um, and we ha that's to explain why we had to do something a little bit more complicated. I don't want to make it 
seem too obscure because that's not the point I want to make, but we do have a model which works well for that. And we, we made vectors of the frequencies of the different species, and we compared them with their, using their inner product. So this was our model. Um, and the underlying you know, Gaussian processes that we have, and we have some Gaussian error here on that. And I'll leave that in. So when we first did our Bayesian calculations, um, actually we wrote a variational Bayes by hand to do this. Um, to begin with, this was done about four years ago. Uh, this is what we got as our output. And so here, we had a whole set of samples, and to be honest, this was very disappointing. This is definitely not what I wanted. That is, I wanted contour plots, but this is, this is not what I wanted. So when we studied a naive approach and tried to project all the posterior distributions on the original data, um, the, the, what you get in the first two dimensions of your original data using multidimensional scaling, this is what you get. So we, we realize that we need to do an extra step. And that extra step is very much like, um, I work on brain imaging. So when you're doing brain imaging, people go in the MRI machine, and even if you have the same person who is, um, for which you have uh, many sets of data, the person you know, moves around in the machine from one day to the next. And so the first thing you need to do is sort of align, and that's called registration. And so what we realize is if you're doing multivariate bays, you need to do registration in the middle. So we have all these different data sets in the inner products here, but they, the point that was missing was the registration, and the registration is done just by using that in a product between matrices that I told you about at the beginning. That is, you can make a matrix of correlation coefficients between matrices and then take the eigenvectors of that matrix. Actually, we take the first one, and that is the consensus space. So it means you've aligned all the different multivariate spaces into one space. So this is called S0, that's the registration, and we're going to project everything onto S0, and that's computed uh, using the first eigenvector of this uh, correlation coefficient between matrices. So we find a low-dimensional consensus space by diagonalizing S0, and this, you know, the first two dimensions, for instance, if you look, and then we project all the points on there. So the, the, if you don't do that, and so um, to backtrack a little bit, I did a little toy problem because people sometimes say, well, I don't quite understand why, um, why, wouldn't, why do you get this mess? And so when I was trying to explain it to one of the students, I thought that this example was maybe um, most helpful if you, you could, because you can try this on your own. If you have, say, um, only a few points, so here I took five points, and I did just um, PCA for those five points, but I made a little model, so there's some noise in them. What happens is if the first two eigenvalues can be quite close, and if eigenvalue one becomes eigenvalue two in, in one of the other um, posterior um, studies, you know, if you get another pick, another sample, and you get a flip, then in fact the plot's gonna go like that. And then the other thing that happens a lot when you're doing PCA is the eigenvector is not well defined, so it could be either that it's in this direction or that direction. So the projection of the points in the end, they're going to be, um, they could change over from left to right, and they could also change like that. And so although these points in some sense should be all projected together because they, they they're in fact, their confidence regions are like this, these great big things which go all around. So, so that's why we need this alignment or this registration. And in the end, uh, when you do the registration, this is the output. So this is a contour plot, and the contour plot shows you us the different, here we have uh, 16 different samples. And so, so here, you have some of the samples. This is one, two, four, three. So these four samples are definitely sort of in an area of their own. They're a different type. And then all of these, in fact, these were the healthy controls. 
And these were the, this one was an intermediary one, and all of these were um, IBD subjects. They have a disease, and they're in a different part of space. But it was very useful to have, um, you know, to be able to look at these contours and decide what part of space, at least, um, are they aligned with, and also the direction. The amount of variance um, in the contour plots is very informative. Here's another one which is all, uh, you know, much more of a success story in some sense because there really was something there. Here we have, um, uh, these are studies of the vaginal microbiome. So I work a lot on trying to predict preterm birth from the microbiota of pregnant women. And we do a lot of studies where we're trying to decide whether we can predict very early on in pregnancy whether um, a woman is going to have a baby early or not. And so we, we looked here. At, this is data of that type. And these blobs that you see in color, this green one, for instance, that's the whole contour plot for one subject. So you can see that most of the subjects, their point, the, the, we have quite narrow, um, we know quite well where the point is going to be projected. We have high confidence in the projection of these points, except for a few in the middle here. So we actually have two points um, which have very, very wide uh, contours. Now, we went back and studied those points, and what we saw was that these points are the ones that um, had the sample counts are very, very low in those points. So there's very high variance. So it's normal in some sense that the points where you have many more observations, you know very well, and the points where you have much less, um, they're, they're, they're much, in some sense, they're much broader. So you have a lot of uncertainty. So that told us that you know, when you want to, to make conclusions, you actually have, we had a, a threshold on the number of um, bacterial counts that we can, we can have in a sample for it to be valid uh, in a predictive way. So in some sense, this has helped us a lot in our design um, to, in the, this, these credible regions in, in the diagnosis of the problems. So, I wanted to conclude on saying that you know, the distances and probabilistic weights are extremely important to think about when you're doing um, not only the programming. So I know they're really important in HMC. I've written several papers about using probability and Hamiltonian methods because you can incorporate somehow um, and change your distance according to the different probabilities. And sometimes we don't go all the way. That is, we do some preliminary transformation of the data to try and equalize some of the densities. So that, that there's an intermediary step, which is um, sort of technical. But it's important to see that there's this trade-off. That is, distances don't tell you everything. It's really important to also know um, the probability that goes with it. So, you can summarize data uh, with any kind of sort of generalization of PCA if you have distances. So the next step um, in studying this is uh, we use when you're doing, if you have a distance, you can generalize, for instance, the mean by doing something called the Frechet mean, which is you find the point which minimizes the sum of squares of weighted distances. And this gives you a way of generalizing, finding an average, but you're taking into account both the probability and a very general distance. And many people often come to see me and say, I'm trying to do statistics, but I'm doing statistics on graphs or statistics on trees. And I don't know how to summarize my data. I don't know how to it give a, a basic statistics. And solution to that is you can find a distance. Now, the big difficulty, of course, is that there are many choices of different distances. And there's a subject called metric learning, where you, are, you input something about what you think two things similar look like and things that are different look like. And it tells you this is the metric you have to use. But basically, if you find the right distance for your data, you probably can solve the problem. So finding 
it, you can't just take it off a shelf without thinking. So there, there's definitely a, a, a problem um, to solve before you get started. But once you've got started, it's very easy. The measures of uncertainty that we use um, in multivariate context, we can't do, you know, just confidence intervals or predictive intervals. We need to do regions of space which have high probability of containing the solutions. And so that requires doing this uncertainty propagation with the registration. And we can compare you know, heterogeneous sources of, uh, of information. And so we also use distances to integrate um, other information, such as uh, network information about um, the different points. So you can use a distance on the network as the skeleton, in some sense, for the distances between the different um, variables. And you can also use tree information. And we use it for measures of diversity. For instance, what we call phylogenetic diversity uses the phylogenetic tree. And we take into account the distances on the tree when we compute the diversity. But, um, and that's also true for contingency tables. You can have distances between the different um, columns. So I'm going to stop there. I, I, I'm very thankful to this community for having developed. Um, the people who developed Stan um, have done a wonderful job. Of course, I'm an R person, and I use R for a lot of what I do. I use R Studio. Um, because it allows me to do reproducible research. Um, and uh, I can choose uh, whether I'm using Hamiltonian or variational Bayes easily. Um, I must say Stan's made a lot of progress with regards to several of the type of data that I have. We've learned how to work around some of the difficulties we had. And I work with mostly biologists who are patient enough and they allow me to use these um, Bayesian methods, even though they get very worried when uh, I ask them, well, what do you know about the data so I can put them in the priors? And so there's a certain reticence, but I think we're getting there. And the collaborators I work with, you know, David Relman and Alfred Sporman have been really important. This is my lab group. And um, we've developed the main tool for using, uh, for using R for the microbiome is called PhiloSeq, and um, that's the tool that I use for the heterogeneous data. And we have um, several, um, for instance, the I didn't show you, but Len, who did the BUDS, the Bayesian Unidimensional Scaling, she has a very nice um, uh, shiny app for choosing the, the width and things like that interactively, and of course, the biologists just love it if they can do everything with Shiny, because they can do everything in a browser, and they don't have to write any code. So that's um, very good. OK, stop there. <laughs>I didn't show you some of the interactive things because it takes a little bit of time to go back and forth. But I always put up all my talks, probably it'll go up next week, um, with all the links to all the, the GitHub and the Shiny apps and the various references. There are quite a few uh, references that I mentioned, which uh, might be useful to people if you want to follow up. Now, I'm staying for lunch, and so if we don't have time too much for if we have a little bit of time for questions, it's good. But if there isn't, um, I'm happy to uh, you know, talk technical at lunch. That's what I came for. So. You said you would prefer to not take first. Questions. No, I can take. No, no, so. no. I was worried about time. So that's fine. I, I galloped through. So it's <laughs> if you have time, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, let's take time. We can, we can blow one. We've not blown a single session, I think, the entire conference. So let's go ahead and blow it, right? This is worth it. OK, you have any questions? Here. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned something about how people would come to you and say, like, oh, I don't see any clusters, but they would have this horseshoe because there was still something varying, like a pH. Um, with the political example you showed, it looked like there was both. Yes. Uh, you had orthogonal horseshoes right. as well as clusters, clearly. Right. So can you maybe, maybe I didn't get something, but can you comment on that sort of thing, like. Yeah. So I think that the way to think about it for you guys, because you're a specialist, is think about latent variables. And you have latent variables of two types. 
You have a latent variable which is uh, categorical, which is the, the uh, oh, sorry, which is the class, and you have latent variables which is continuous, which is this gradient. So in fact, you're in, you're in presence of two types, mixed type of latent variables. So you could model it with a hierarchical model in some sense and think about those two. Um, and here in the hierarchy, it was the latent variable which was categorical which came first. So it, it just depends. But absolutely, that's the way of thinking about it. But I just think that people get too, um, the, the, uh, clustering in some sense is too popular. I, I, certainly in my world of biology, um, people are out there, they're just saying, oh, I see these clusters in the data, and, I, and it's just this continuum here, and it's not, and they, they take some, I didn't show you, but there's some terrible things that they do where they, you know, they, they see the continuum, they, they drop points which, um, uh, so that the, 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 the data cluster better. So you, if, you block, if you drop some of the points which are intermediate, then you can make it cluster. But the question is, in high dimensions, um, it's quite sparse data. So it might be, in fact, that you're, you're just projecting. the A clustering algorithm will always give you clusters. So that's what it does. But you have to question it sometimes. And so that's a, that's a problem. All right, Bob. All right, who, somebody did not Bob. All right, there we go. Okay, Bob's very generous. Uh, who's closest? Oh, my God. Uh, I'm okay. okay, you. <laughs> um, th thank you for your talk. It was just fascinating. Um, so I'm wondering about the, um, the step where you have the different matrices of your latent scores, the MDS scores. Yeah. And then you were using that. Um, yeah, that inner product between yeah. the matrices, yeah. Yeah, the R, uh, RV RC. coefficient, but there's other types. I mean, the, there's a, in kernel worlds, there's a HSIC. There's another type of inner product that you could use here. It just depends on what you want. So it's, it's like the fact that for ordinary data, there are different types of correlation coefficients, different weightings. The idea is just basically I wanted to be simple and I, maybe I shouldn't have cut out so much of the technical stuff, but maybe the jet lag made me think, oh, I'm not going to get through this, um, that the, the, you want to be able to compare two matrices and make a correlation coefficient, just one number that you can put in this. So if I did a 10,000 um, different posterior samples, I would get a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix of correlations between all those different picks, right? And then I get this, and I make the eigenvector of that matrix. And then that will give me the registration. It gives me the S0. So it's very simple um, in some sense. It allows you to automatically register all the matrices into one common space, which we could call the compromise. So that, that's what we use. And then we project everything together. What it does is, um, it gets rid of all this flipping and everything. It moves everything so that everything is aligned. It's an alignment. And uh, is that the question? Was that the? Yeah, I, I was wondering if like, uh, you, you know that these different matrices are related to each other. So could you try to uh, parameterize it by putting in a parameter for when the samples are taken over time or something like that? Try to get them in the same space? Maybe we should talk about that at lunch, and I'd explain more of the technical. <laughs> <laughs> because you can use more of the information than just doing this in a, this correlation coefficient if you wanted to align better. But I, I just say there's a problem there that people didn't seem to have addressed in a, a systematic way. And so that's what we, we tried to do. We came across it when we were doing this Bayesian uh, non-parametric model for, 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 the, for count data. So, Is uh, Shoshana here? You're the next speaker, and I don't see you teeing up. What? You got to go. It's time. No. All right. What are our gym? Okay, fine. Sorry. Okay. Uh, quick question. If everybody's got one. Real quick. I know. Is it quick? Bob. Got a pretty quick one. So the only data that I'm familiar with here is the political data. And when you cluster this, you often get multiple clusters. So there's the strong party identification um, voting. But then there's often like a green component or a social versus economic component. So what Are you happens? European? No. <laughs> it's very true for European data. It's not true for the US. 
Um, so, so what happens in the US, the political scientists have an image of the ideal point. You have an ideal point on the, on the gradient of your party. And um, you know, there are different questions that you vote on. Uh, and they really correspond. You have an ideal point, and you'll vote you know, against or for, depending it's whether you're on the left or right, uh, whether that question has to do with um, being more on the right, more on the left. So they sure, have sure. This we, had, we had a nice lecture on IRT and ideal yeah. points yesterday. So, so, I think so, the, so the, the ideal point is exactly what's going on here. You have an underlying um, zero one uh, po uh, point. And, and that's where it situates, and that tells you how you're voting. So um, yeah. I think. Okay, we could, we could probably take this up right. later. Okay. 